So there we have it, a stable vacuum, strong enough to hold the tape securely within its channels. That's a challenge in itself, but it's only a small fraction of the far larger and perhaps more ambitious challenge. But to truly grasp the origins of this particular project and the impressive engineering from which we draw our inspiration, we must journey back to the 1960s, a time when the undisputed king of high-speed magnetic tape resided firmly within the domains of the mainframe. Please listen to Curious Mark, who will delve into the intricacies of the IBM 729 tape drive. So this tape is uh, called vacuum column tape and uh, the, the way it works is that instead of going directly under the reed head, the tape first is sucked in by vacuum in this vacuum column right here that Carl just opened for us and then it allows the tape to coil into a reservoir here and the capstan can pull on it very very fast, it can start and stop. Uh, so fast that he can just read one record at a time. Uh, and of course that's done so this can be operated like disk drives, which didn't exist at the time. So, so in a second we are going to uh, hit the load button and you will see how the tape is sucked in the vacuum column. Actually you will hear the vacuum coming on first. Uh, so Carl, if you can load it. Right. And here we go. And then what you see, the reels moving here, is just uh, the reel trying to keep the level of the tape at the right place over here. And right here behind this door, there's a little hole and this senses vacuum and activates the little, the little vacuum contact. So all the reels do is react to replenish the supply in the vacuum tape and the tape itself is driven by another motor right here uh, at a much faster rate. I really like the mechanical elegance of those tape drives. It seems like proper engineering. Now let's bring things back down to earth, to my own slightly more modest encounters with magnetic tape growing up in the 80s. For many of us, the compact audio cassette was the go-to medium. Not exactly cutting edge, but it worked. Take the Commodore dataset, 50 bytes per second, which was quite sufficient for those with a degree in patience. Then came hacks like turbo tape, improving that to about 500 bytes per second, a tenfold boost, but still not very stellar. So what's the real limit if we ignore cost and simplicity? Commodore used a pulse width modulation scheme to encode the data, but that barely scratches the surface of the cassette's actual capacity. They offer 50 to 60 dBs of dynamic range. If we use that and potentially increase the tape speed, we're in a completely different ballpark. Shannon's theorem can give us a hint of this potential. If we assume 15 kHz of bandwidth, and a 40 dB signal to noise ratio, we can get some 20 kilobytes per second. If we push the dynamic range to 60 dB, we get almost 30 kilobytes per second. This is of course under ideal conditions, which we definitely won't have, but let's set a goal to load 64K in under 10 seconds, an order of magnitude beyond even the fastest turbo tape loaders. However, speed brings challenges. We'll be borrowing a few ideas from the IBM design, including direct drive and vacuum columns. In this episode, we are focusing on the negative pressure system, pulling the tape into stable loops just like the IBM 729. That's at the core of our little turbo cassette station. The tape runs off one reel, touches a roller before descending into the vacuum column. When it comes up again, it gets pinched between a roller and a capstan and then moves over to the right hand side roller capstan pair to enter the second column and then back up on the right hand side roller and on to the receiving reel. The cassette itself contains the reels and rollers, but the capstan and pinch roller will be supplied by the tape station. 
The tape will be guided by the roller and the pinch roller, something like this. Also, we might need to take a little notch out from the cassette to allow the tape to descend vertically. I first tried with the obvious solution of using a PC fan, to which I attached an adapter with channels in. The result wasn't great. One channel sucked, the other bomb blew. So I went on a quest to change the adapter design to stop it from blowing. I changed the channel dimensions, the adapter flow pattern, added more motors, but nothing worked. So I started to suspect that the fan just didn't produce high enough pressure. Since we probably need almost no airflow through the channels, the most important design parameter is the static pressure. And perhaps the static pressure of the PC fan is just too low. I realized that I didn't know what kind of pressure I needed, so I set up a rig to determine just that. I'm using a vacuum cleaner, in which I insert this tube, whose other end is attached to this adapter. The cassette slides in like this, and I can adjust the pressure by varying the distance between the tube and the vacuum hose. After some fiddling, I found a suitable range. So then I devised this makeshift pressure gauge and I found that the corresponding pressure was about 45 to 75 millimeters of water. So therefore I set the pressure target to 60 millimeters of water. Then I went on to check what kind of static pressure the Noctua fan actually produced. and it was not impressive, just 2 millimeters of water. So I decided to take a 24 volt DC motor that I had laying around and design a centrifugal air pump with it. I printed a holder and a plate with fan blades that I just snapped onto the motor axis. I created a top piece and attached the tube to it and I was ready to measure its performance. It didn't run very smooth, nor did I get any substantial pressure. I barely got 10 millimeters of water at 9 volts. I managed to stabilize it and measure its pressure and power draw as a function of the supplied voltage. The pressure increase about linearly with the voltage, while the power seemed to be quadratic. I managed to reach some 26 millimeters at 24 volts. Let's focus on the 24 volt data point. So I started to experiment with different impeller designs and looked at their power and pressure. With the longer blades, the pressure improved a bit, but the power decreased surprisingly. Reducing the number of blades increased the power, but not the pressure. Using seven straight blades improved the pressure significantly, but at the cost of a significantly higher power. But making more blades achieved the opposite. Since all of these data points more or less fall within the range about 30 to 35 millimeters, I draw the perhaps hasty conclusion that I needed a more powerful motor. Given the quadratic relationship of the power, I calculated that I need about 30 watts to reach 60 millimeters. I found it to be a bit surprising that I would need 30 watts to keep two small flimsy pieces of tape in place. But I thought nothing more of it. I found this 12 volt 30 watt motor online and adapted the setup to it and started the testing. And that was disappointing, just barely 20 millimeters. It was the same for the other impeller designs, getting just over half the pressure and at a higher power at that. Then I realized that I was an idiot. I didn't need more power. 
I needed more kV. The speed of an idling DC motor is roughly proportional to the supply voltage. I had chosen a motor with an apparently rather low kV and 12 volts brings it up to at max 4350 which is insufficient for the pressure I want. But instead of shopping around for a faster motor I thought that maybe I can use the fact that this motor is slow but strong, that is to drive a larger impeller. I could also have the advantage of keeping the noise down. So I doubled the diameter of the impeller from 78 to 155 millimeters. Now we are talking, we are approaching 60 millimeters, although this is at an over voltage. I tried a number of different impeller designs, where the number of blades, the length, angle attack and other parameters were varied, but it was very hard to reach 60 millimeters at 12 volts. The big breakthrough came after a tip from my brother who suggested to make the impeller a closed house, so I did. The idea being by closing the house on both sides the air resistance should decrease and therefore improve the speed and hence it should result in a higher pressure. Finally, 60 millimeters of water at close to 12 volts. I call that a success. Now it is time to integrate the cassette holder with the fan. I have constructed a housing that looks like this. As before, the cassette goes in at the top. And these transparent sheets of acrylic comprise the fronts of the vacuum channels to make sure there is no gap at the edge down here. The channels come out at the bottom on the other side into a large chamber to be evacuated by the fan. This is the ceiling of that chamber that needs to be screwed down due to the forces on that rather large area. This is the motor holder that goes on top of the fence. The motor is inserted and this is a somewhat tight fit. Now we just snap in the best impeller and completes the assembly. Then we hook it up and checks that the impeller spins freely. And now, it is time for testing of the vacuum channels. Will they behave properly with the amount of suction that we have? Will 12 volts be enough? Let's start slow at 6 volts. The left channel seems to be working fine. Let's check the right channel. That is also working pretty nice. It's not perfect, but we are only at half speed. So we have plenty of margin to adjust it up or down as we need. That's everything for this episode. In the next one we'll tackle the tape movement and its control. Thanks for watching and see you in the next one.